Pamela Rose Aldrich McCall was born in Cedar Rapids in Iowa. She was described by her mom as free-spirited and transient. Pamela would often hitchhike through Virginia and Tennessee. In 1991, that was exactly what she was doing, living in Virginia and hitchhiking to different areas. On March 10, 1991, just after 12 p.m., the Spring Hill Police Department responded to a report of a body located on Saturn Parkway at an off-ramp for Port Loyal Road. The body belonged to a white female. The female had torn clothing, undergarments, and obvious injuries to the face and neck. Using her fingerprints, she was identified to be 33-year-old Pamela Rose Aldrich McCall. It was concluded that Pamela had been strangled. Sadly, it was also discovered that she had been 24 weeks pregnant at the time her life was taken. The unborn child did not survive. Some witnesses did come forward telling the police that Pamela had been traveling with a truck driver. The statements from the witnesses and DNA evidence collected from the crime scene was all the police had to go on. It was not enough and the case went cold. In April of 2019, the Spring Hill Police Department reopened the case. The investigator working the case submitted the evidence they collected back in 1991 to a crime lab for DNA analysis. The analysis helped them create a full DNA profile and they now knew the man they are looking for is a white male. The profile was then entered into the CODIS database. The DNA matched the DNA that was recovered at two other unsolved cases from Wyoming in 1992. The police now knew that whoever ended the life of Pamela and her unborn child also took the lives of at least two other victims. They just needed to find out who that man is. A lot of state and federal agencies then had to work together to find the man. This included the FBI, US Secret Service, Wyoming Division of Criminal Investigations and the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigations. Finally, their investigation resulted in 59-year-old Clark Perry Baldwin being identified as a suspect in Pamela's case as well as the two Wyoming cases. Baldwin was a former truck driver and resident of Waterloo, Iowa. In May 2020, he was taken into custody by police and he will now finally serve time for his crimes after all these years. Eight-year-old Kelly Ann Prosser lived in Columbus, Ohio with her family. On September 20, 1982, Kelly Ann was walking home from Indianola Elementary School. Somewhere between her home and a school in the Columbus University District, she was abducted. When Kelly Ann did not arrive home, her mom, Linda Prosser, got worried. She called the school, but they had no idea where she was. The police was then called, and a search for her started. Then, two days later, on the 22nd, Kelly Ann's body was found in a nearby cornfield in Madison County. She had been assaulted and strangled. The Columbus Police Department launched an extensive investigation. They preserved all the evidence from the crime scene so that it could be used later. The police department also questioned a lot of people. But sadly, they could not gather any useful information and the case went cold. In 2015, the DNA they found at the crime scene was entered into the CODIS database. Unfortunately, no matches came out of the database. In March 2020, the police department partnered with Advanced DNA, a forensic genealogy research company, which used a DNA sample to assemble a family tree for the potential suspect and provide additional leads for the detectives. With more DNA testing and some investigative work, the police finally had their man, Harold Warren Jarrell. In 1977, Harold abducted a different eight-year-old girl also in Columbus. He was sent to prison but released in January 1982, just eight months before the abduction of Kelly Ann. 
her family was thankful to the police department. They do not however feel that they have closure or justice since Harold passed away. He lost his life in Las Vegas in 1996 at the age of 67. He would have been 53 years old when he abducted Kellyanne. In a statement, the family had this to say. When Kelly Ann left for school the morning of September 20, 1982, we did not expect our time with her would abruptly end or that our future would change in every way imaginable. One moment we had this dazzling, mischievous, eight-year-old little girl, when suddenly all we had left were memories, photographs that will never age, a calendar marking a dreadful new holiday, a grave, and pieces of Kelly's life stored in a box. Twenty-three-year-old mother of two, Betty Lee Jones, lived in Boulder County, Colorado back in 1970 along with her husband. She and her husband, Robert Ray Jones, had only been married for nine days. The last two of those days, the pair spent arguing. Their last argument took place on March 8, 1970 in their home that was located in Denver at 12th Street and York Street. It culminated in Robert leaving the residence in his car and Betty trying to flag down cars in the street near their residence. Betty was last seen climbing into a blue sedan that had stopped. The car then went southbound on York Street. This happened at about 3.30 p.m. The next day, on March 9th, two Colorado Department of Transportation workers came across a woman's lifeless body down the side of an embankment on Highway 128 near the Boulder County-Jefferson County line. The woman had been bound, assaulted, and strangled. She was quickly identified as Betty Lee Jones. Even though she was last seen climbing into a stranger's car, suspicion still fell on her husband, Robert. Both the police and her family believed Robert was responsible. The police found no concrete evidence linking him to the crime, however, and they did not find the owner of the blue sedan, so the case went cold. In 2006, the case was reopened. DNA that was taken from Betty's body back in 1970 was then submitted to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation. The profile that was created was entered into the CODIS database, but no matches were made. The police had the idea of trying to see whether the DNA matched the DNA of Betty's husband, Robert. Since he had passed away in 2000, his parents had to give their DNA samples. After more DNA testing, it was confirmed that the DNA did not match Robert's, and he was ruled out as a suspect. Throughout the years, there were a lot of advances in DNA technology. In 2019, the DNA of the suspect was submitted to a private lab called Bode Technologies. They were able to create a more refined DNA profile. This allowed them to develop the family tree of the suspect. Eventually, it was narrowed down to two sons of a woman who they believed were closely related to the suspect. Only one of the two sons were still living. The other one was deceased in 1977. The living one was interviewed and DNA samples were taken. He told investigators that he had a different brother than the one that had passed away in 1977. His name was Paul and the family last heard from him back in 1970, the same year as when Betty's life was taken. He also owned a blue sedan like the one Betty was last seen climbing into. After ruling out the brother who told them about Paul and the one that passed away in 1977, the investigators knew they had to locate Paul. In April 2020, they did locate Paul. They found him in Fort Logan National Cemetery. He passed away in June 2019. On April 8, 2020, his body was exhumed for DNA testing. Then, on April 24th, it was confirmed that Paul Leroy Martin's DNA matched the DNA collected from Betty's body. It is not believed that Betty and Paul knew each other. 
The police theorized that Betty climbed into his car that day, and at some point, he assaulted her and ended her life. Sheriff Joe Pell had this to say. In addition to our sincere thanks to CBI, the FBI, and all the contributing scientists and investigators, I would like to personally thank Detective Steve Ainsworth for his diligent work and tenacity for solving this very cold case, which was so brutally committed. Steve has a long career, much of it dedicated to cold cases, and he does a wonderful job for these victims and their families. In 1999, Michelle Bright was a 17-year-old girl from a small town named Golgong in New South Wales, Australia. Her mom Lorraine described her as perfect from the day she was born. She was so lovely, a tomboy who loved other people and animals. She wanted to be a veterinary nurse. On the night of the 26th of February 1999, Michelle attended a 15th birthday party of her friend Lauren. After the party, she was dropped off at a commercial hotel a few streets away from her friend's house. This was the last time she was seen, in front of the hotel at about 12.45 am. I could not find any information as to why she was dropped off here and not at her home. The next day, Michelle had still not returned home and her mom Lorraine got worried. Lorraine and her family drove around in the rain anxiously looking for her. When they could not find Michelle anywhere, the police was called. Inside Michelle's room, a police officer found over-the-counter medication and announced that she was a runaway with an amphetamine habit. I kept telling them that she wasn't a runaway and the medication didn't belong to her. We were so close, I knew she would never have left me. They just wouldn't listen. Then, two days after Michelle went missing, the police finally had to listen. That afternoon, Michelle's body was found in a long grass near the train tracks on Barney Reef Road, less than a mile from her home. It was clear as she was strangled and assaulted. The police and the family theorized that someone must have offered her a ride and then decided to take her life. The police questioned a lot of people, but no useful information came to light. In the year 2000, a $1,000 reward was issued for any information leading to an arrest in Michelle's case, but unfortunately no one came forward. Then in 2020, the police and the family appealed to the public for anyone with information to come forward. They also upped their reward to $1 million. Almost immediately, someone came forward with valuable information. Then on August 12, a 53-year-old man by the name of Craig Henry Rumsby was arrested. It was not made public what exactly the informant told police had led to them arresting Craig in connection with Michelle's case. There are a lot of facts we do know, however. At the time of the crime, Craig lived in the same street as Michelle. He also knew the family for many years. He posted this on Facebook about Michelle. Craig was also indicted for assault offenses relating to an incident involving an 18-year-old woman from Golgong on January 1st, 1998. The detective in the case said, as a result of the recent couple of days, we were able to obtain evidence that we will allege in court strongly implicates this person has been involved in what happened to Michelle. Michelle's mom was shocked to hear the news. It's the most unbearable pain that we have to live with every day of our life and we miss her so much. The police are still asking people to come forward if they have any information. Even the smallest bit of information could help. Raymond Carl Nelson was born on the 1st of September 1911. He graduated from Logan High School in 1931. On November 19, 1934, he married Helen Louise Smith. The couple stayed in Logan, Utah. They had two children, Roberta and Claudia. Raymond was last seen 
on December 3, 1940. He brought his laundry over to his parents' house. His sister recalls he had tears in his eyes when he was there. Nine days after Raymond was last seen, a truck driver came forward, saying he gave Raymond a lift to Omaha. He claims that Raymond told him he needed to be at the Omaha airport the next morning, where he was to report for employment. The police searched for Raymond in Omaha, but found no sign of him. This led them to believe that he met with foul play. His social security number was never used after he was last seen. The FBI also looked for him and classified him as a draft dodger. Roberta Nelson was just four months old when her father disappeared, later had this to say. Personally, I've always preferred to think that he didn't disappear on purpose, as something terrible might have happened to him. His mother, my grandmother, always told me until the day she passed that she was sure something terrible had to have happened to him because he was a good man and he would never have left us on purpose. My mother always told me that I had no marital problems. Roberta went on to have a child by the name of Jennifer Huffman. Jennifer became a personal investigator and wanted to find her grandfather. She learned that Raymond had a great interest in model airplanes. He also knew how to build them. His planes were displayed in a Brandeis window in downtown Omaha. Brandeis was a big department store whose window displays were famous in the area. Jennifer decided to go on to model airplane sites. She believed that if Raymond was still alive, he would have pursued his interest. On one of the sites, she found an Australian man that she believed looked like Raymond. His name was Monty Tyrell. Her research unfortunately hit a dead end at one point and she was not able to confirm if Monty was indeed her missing grandfather. But then in May 2020, Jennifer received a phone call from a man named Mark Nelson. He had extra time on his hands during the quarantine and he was looking for information on his ancestry. He found that his grandfather's name was Roy C. Nelson, but he could not find any information on him before 1940. Mark told Jennifer that his grandfather's obituary led him to his great-grandparents, Nels and Millie Nelson. Mark found that they had a son named Raymond and not Roy. This confused him, but he figured that maybe his grandfather did not like the name Raymond, and that is why he went by the name Roy. Mark then looked through the U.S. Census records, and this showed that his grandfather lived in Iowa, although his grandfather claimed he was from Hibbing, Minnesota. Mark Nelson also discovered that Raymond Nelson and Roy Nelson had the same birth date. What really sealed the deal for him was when he found World War II draft cards. Roy and Raymond's draft cards from World War II had the exact same handwriting. He then looked up more information about Raymond Nelson. He came across an article showing that Raymond Nelson was missing and that his granddaughter Jennifer was looking for him. And that is why he called her. The two of them then worked together and confirmed that Roy Nelson and Raymond Nelson was the same person. After Raymond left his family and changed his name to Roy, he went on to have six children, 24 grandchildren, and 21 great-grandchildren. Why he left his family is still unknown. Details of the new life he created for himself is also not known. What is known, however, is it was pretty crappy of him to let his family do his laundry just before he abandoned them. Twenty-year-old Robin Brooks lived in Sacramento, California in April 1980. She only lived there for six months, having moved there from New York. She picked up a job as a clerk at a donut restaurant called Donut Time. On April 24, 1980, Robin left her regular shift at Donut Time just after midnight. She was expected to meet up with her friends for a swim date, but she never showed up. The next day, Robin did not show up for work either. One of her friends got worried so he went to her apartment. He forced his way in and found Robin's lifeless body in her bedroom. She was assaulted 
and stabbed multiple times. Investigators found DNA from the attacker at the crime scene. It was saved to a database but could not be matched to anyone. In 1980, there were no immediate suspects and the case went cold. Then in 2016, Sergeant Mickey Lynx turned to genetic genealogy to help solve this case. This led them to 71-year-old Philip Lee Wilson. At the time of the crime, Wilson lived less than two miles from where Robin lived. It is unclear if the two of them knew each other. Wilson faced assault and battery charges in Sacramento County in 1985. He also had run-ins with police in Texas. Wilson was arrested at his home in April 2020 in the Hackenwood section of North Sacramento, exactly 40 years after Robin's life was taken. Wilson is being held without bail at a Sacramento County main jail. The Sacramento County Sheriff Scott Jones said, We never forget about the victims. In fact, in many respects, that's all we think about. Sometimes these cases take a bit longer to solve than others, but none of them are forgotten. None of them are put on a shelf forever. Robin's sister Maria said, Today is a bittersweet anniversary. This arrest hopefully will give hope to other victims of unsolved crimes. I know Robin is smiling and saying, job well done. Fifty-four-year-old James Patterson lived in McHarrafeld, Northern Ireland. On Sunday evening, October 6, 1991, James visited a friend at a mid Ulster hospital. That was the last time he was seen. He and his blue-green Ford Orion car just disappeared. There were widespread searches, but his whereabouts remained a mystery. His family was left not knowing what happened to their loved one. It was one of Northern Ireland's longest-running missing persons cases. Then on July 18, 2020, a car was spotted in the River Ban by a local search and rescue team. It is a popular touring and angling spot in New Ferry Road. The car was then pulled out of the water and was a blue-green Ford Orion, the same type of car that James Patterson was last seen driving in. Human remains were found inside the car and were identified as Mr. Patterson. The remains were released back to the family. Finally, a funeral service was held in McHarrafeld. This was not the outcome the family would have been hoping for, but at least they now know. The circumstances of his passing are not being treated as suspicious. It seems like it was just a tragic accident. Seventeen-year-old Jessica Bagan lived in Sitka, Alaska. On May 4, 1996, she finished celebrating her 17th birthday at her sister's house. Her parents' home was about a mile away, so she decided to walk. It was around 1 a.m., much later than her usual curfew, but she had permission to stay out later because she was celebrating. Initially, her parents weren't worried. They assumed she was still celebrating and lost track of time. As it got later, however, they feared that something might have happened to her. So they called the police to file a missing persons report. Jessica never made it home that night and she was never seen alive again. Two days after she went missing, the police found a blouse, a green letterman jacket, some jewelry and a sock near a bike path. All of these items of clothing belonged to Jessica. Students often walked along this bike path to get to and from the nearby Sheldon Jackson College campus. A couple of hours later, Jessica's body was found in a wooded area not far from the bike path. She was assaulted and then strangled. Her eyes were blacked, suggesting that she had been struck across the face or head. A man by the name of Richard Bingham, a janitor employed at a nearby college, confessed to the crime within a week. He knew significant details, but it would turn out that his confession was false. 
Richard would eventually be acquitted by a jury in 1997 for lack of physical evidence. Jessica's family hired a private investigator, but that yielded no results. Upwards of 100 DNA profiles were tested during the years, but no matches were found and the case went cold. Then in 2019, investigators entered a sample of the suspect's DNA profile into a public genetic genealogy database and used the result to track down a promising suspect. They finally had a name, Stephen Allen Branch. In August 2020, officers went to interview the now 66-year-old suspect at his home in Austin, Arkansas, where he had relocated in 2010. Stephen denied any involvement and also declined to give a voluntary DNA sample to be tested against the profile found on a victim. Records show that Stephen Branch had committed an assault against another teenage girl in Sitka the same year Jessica Bagan's life was taken. However, he was acquitted. Less than an hour after the police interview, Stephen Branch took his own life. The police obtained a warrant to collect a DNA sample during his autopsy to be tested against the profile found at the crime scene. It was a match. Finally, over two decades and one false confession later, the case of 17-year-old Jessica Bagan was finally solved. On December 20, 1996, a woman's body was found by a Union 76 truck stop in Lake Township, Ohio. The woman was quickly identified as 27-year-old Victoria Jane Collins, who lived in Cleveland, Ohio. She was last seen a few days earlier leaving a bar in the Cleveland area with a woman and two men. Victoria was assaulted and passed away due to cardiac arrest. The police questioned the people she was last seen with, her friends and her family members. It led them no closer to finding out who did this to her, however. They collected DNA evidence that belonged to the suspect at the crime scene. In 2019, a 51-year-old man by the name of Samuel Legg was arrested for a different cold case in Medina County. Samuel had to give a DNA sample when he was arrested. When investigators entered his DNA into their database, they noticed that it matched the DNA found at a crime scene of the Victoria Collins case. That was not all. His DNA also linked him to a cold case from Lake County, Illinois. It also seems likely that he was involved in cold cases from Wood County and Mahoning County. Samuel used to be a truck driver in the Midwest and he lived in Ohio at the time of the crimes. He was extradited to Medina County from Arizona on a $1 million bond. He is now still in custody in Ohio awaiting trial. It took 24 years for this case to be solved. Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost said, Tenacious work by law enforcement and cutting-edge DNA technology have continued to unravel his crimes. On August 22nd, a woman's body was found in an apartment in Fresno County, California. She was identified as 22-year-old college student Debbie Dorian. Her body was bound at her hands and feet with duct tape. The duct tape was also wrapped around her head, covering her mouth, nose and eyes. Investigators collected DNA evidence from the crime scene and entered it into the CODIS database, but there were no matches. Then in 2002, investigators in Fresno learned that a DNA recovered from Debbie's case was matched to an assault in Visalia, California. The Visalia police did not have a suspect named Ivor. A break in the case finally came in 2018 when investigators decided to make use of genetic genealogy. Genetic genealogy compares unknown DNA evidence from a crime scene to public genealogy databases, which are populated by the DNA of family members who voluntarily upload their DNA. 
this led investigators to 52-year-old Nicky Stein. In January 2020, he was charged with the assault and taking the life of Debbie. Debbie's mom was very happy to know who did this to her daughter before she passed away. She also expressed her gratitude to the detectives who helped solve the case. She said her daughter was a feisty and wonderful person. You miss seeing her wedding for holidays and you miss what she would look like. It took 24 years for this case to be solved. Nancy Doherty lived in Chisholm, Minnesota. She was a mother of two and married. Her husband was overseas for the Air National Guard. Nancy worked as a part-time bartender and as a nursing home aide. She was unfaithful to her husband and also had a boyfriend. On the night of July 15, 1986, Nancy and her boyfriend went out drinking. Thereafter, the boyfriend dropped her off at her home. The next morning, he tried to contact Nancy, but she did not answer. He then asked the police to do a welfare check on her. Chisholm police knocked on her door, but no one answered. They finally managed to enter her home and made a startling discovery. Nancy Doherty's body was found on the floor. She had been assaulted and beaten before she was strangled. The police were able to retrieve DNA evidence of a possible suspect at the scene of the crime. A DNA profile was then created. However, the profile matched to no one in a criminal database. The police interviewed and collected DNA from more than 100 people, but it led nowhere. The boyfriend was briefly looked into because he was the last person to have seen her. He was ruled out, however. Same with the husband. The police had no other leads, and the case sadly went cold. Then, in 2020, detectives at the Chisholm Police Department had the idea of contacting Parabon Nanolabs, a company which analyzes public genealogy databases and helps law enforcement programs identify case leads. Parabon Nanolab's work turned up an apparent match. 52-year-old Michael Allen Carbo Jr. is a Chisholm, Minnesota resident. The identification of Michael raised a few questions. Michael was only a teenager at the time Nancy's life was taken, and he did not know her. He was not even a person of interest back in 1986. He did, however, attend school with her children and lived less than a mile from her home. A follow-up investigation did match Michael's DNA to the original DNA profile. He was arrested in July 2020 and could be sentenced to up to 40 years in prison for what he did. Chisholm Police Chief Vern Manor said, This is the day Nancy Doherty's family and all of Chisholm have waited for over 34 years. He also read a statement made by Nancy's daughter, Gina. My mom loved to help people. There are no words to describe the terrible holes that were left in so many lives, including my own. Christine Jessup was a nine-year-old girl living in Queensville, Ontario, Canada. On the 3rd of October, 1984, Christine's mom and her older brother Kenny went to Kenny's dentist appointment. Christine's father, Bob, was in a detention center. This meant Christine was left behind on her own at her house. At roughly 4 p.m., Christine's mom and Kenny arrived home and noticed Christine was not there. They were not immediately worried, because they assumed she went out to play, even though she was ordered to stay home. After some more time passed, they did get worried, and the police were called. Queensville is a very small town of about 600 people. The search for her immediately started, and news of her disappearance spread throughout the town. A witness came forward claiming he saw Christine at the store buying gum just a few minutes before 4 p.m. After searching the immediate area surrounding her house, the police classified her case as an abduction. Her friends and family members were all questioned. 
one of the people had the police looked into was Christine's neighbor, Guy Paul Moran. It is not known why the police showed so much interest in him. He was in his 20s, lived with his parents and had no history that would indicate that he would want to abduct a little girl. A police dog also showed great interest in his car. The fact that he had a rock-solid alibi was ignored by the police. On New Year's Eve 1984, a couple months after Christine was last seen, her body was found. It was about 25 miles away from Queensville in a field. Christine was assaulted and then stabbed. DNA of a male suspect was found on her underwear. Back in 1984, DNA was still a very new process and there was not much that could be done with it. So investigators stored it so it could be used later. The question still was, who did this to 9-year-old Christine? The police still focused on Guy Morin and interviewed him several times. That led to them arresting him. It is unclear exactly what he said, but apparently he exhibited odd behavior and knew a lot of details about the site where she was found. The media portrayed him as a sick loner who obsessed over Christine, which certainly did not help his case. While awaiting trial, an inmate came forward claiming that Guy confessed to him that he took Christine's life. During a second trial, the jury found Guy Morin guilty of taking her life. Guy appealed this decision. This was in 1995. By then, DNA technology was a bit more advanced. After DNA testing, it was discovered that DNA found at the crime scene of the suspect did not match Guy Morin. Guy was exonerated. He was also given $1.2 million for wrongful conviction. This meant that 11 years have passed and investigators were back to square one. 25 more years would go by before this case would be solved. In October 2020, Toronto police announced that they had used genetic genealogy to identify the man that ended the life of Christine. Genetic genealogy combines DNA analysis of genealogical research by matching a sample to a database of DNA to determine a familiar relationship and identify a likely suspect. The man identified is Calvin Hoover. He was a family friend of the Jessops. He was 28 years old at the time of the crime. Calvin ended his own life back in 2015. Investigators say that if he was still alive today, he would have been arrested for the crime. He was never a suspect in the case, but was a person of interest because he knew the family and lived close to them. Calvin was one of the people who helped search for Christine, and he also attended her funeral. Christine's family are relieved to now know, but they are also shocked that someone they know committed such a heinous crime. Sixty-four-year-old Sherry Black lived in South Salt Lake in Utah. She had a business called B&W Billiards and Books. On November 30, 2010, she was working. That day, a client came in with a malicious intent. The client beat Sherry and stabbed her multiple times. Her body was later found in the store. At the crime scene, an Armani Exchange men's belt was found with a waist measurement of approximately 36 inches. Importantly, blood of the suspect was left behind at a crime scene as well. For years, the case went cold. Then in 2017, South Salt Lake Police turned to Parabon Nanolabs for help to develop a phenotype composite of the suspect based on DNA from the crime scene. For the next few years, Parabon Nanolabs and investigators worked hard to match the DNA found at a crime scene to someone. Their investigation led them to 29-year-old Adam Derborough. In October 2020, they obtained a DNA sample from him for more testing. It was then confirmed that his DNA matched the DNA found at the crime scene. He was just 19 years old at the time of the crime. Investigators noticed that two years after Sherry's life was taken, 
Adam made Facebook posts where he claimed that he took someone's life. He lived less than a mile from the bookstore. Adam was in trouble several times as a juvenile. He maintained a minor criminal history since becoming an adult, according to court records. After the police arrested him, Adam confessed to the crime. He is currently held without bail at a Salt Lake County Jail. Investigators noted how difficult it was to track Adam down. He is adopted, which made it almost impossible to find him using DNA. His social media revealed he struggled with issues from his past and had a bad relationship with his adoptive father, who served time in prison. Adam's family is devastated when they heard the news. They issued a statement. It has never crossed our minds that the events from a horrific and tragic event nearly a decade ago would have involved a member of our family. While we are devastated with the apparent involvement of our son Adam's role in this event, we wish to simply express our condolences to the family, friends and loved ones of Sherry Black. 54-year-old James Richard Harris lived in Walker County, Georgia. On the 22nd of December 1994, he left his house to go to his work at Miller Industries. James never made it to his work, however. Just after leaving his house, he was robbed and his life was taken. The police were called to his house after a witness saw James lying next to his pickup at the end of his driveway. James had a routine and was known to carry a large amount of cash on him. The police saw that all of the cash was stolen. It appeared as if the motive was burglary. It was also clear that James put up a fight against his attacker. In 1994, a composite sketch of a possible suspect, as seen by the witness, was released. A man in his 20s with a bruise on his forehead. Evidence was collected from the crime scene, but the police had no leads and no suspects. That was until 2009. They received a tip from Crime Stoppers. It is not known what exactly the tip was, but it led police to Robert A. Murray. He also fitted the description of the suspect. After thousands of tips coming in and lots of interviews, the police still had no concrete evidence proving that Robert is responsible for taking the life of James. Then in 2020, a sample of Robert's DNA was taken and it matched the DNA found at a crime scene back in 1994. In September 2020, 50-year-old Robert Murray was arrested. The police say the motive of the crime is still unknown. They still want anyone with information to come forward to give more detail about the crime. Mary London was a 17-year-old sophomore at Sacramento High School. She was developmentally disabled. On January 14, 1981, Mary was reported missing after she did not show up for a scheduled ride to school. The next day, on the morning of January 15, her body was found dumped on the side of the road west of Interstate 5. All the Sacramento Police Department could do was collect DNA from the suspect at the crime scene. For decades, detectives have returned to Mary's case, hoping to find the person responsible. In 2016, 35 years after the crime took place, detectives reopened the case. They asked for the community's help in finding a man named Daryl. Daryl was not listed as a suspect, but a friend of Mary and the officers wanted to ask him some questions. Sacramento Police Chief Daniel Hahn had an idea of using genetic genealogy to help solve this case. The DNA evidence that was taken at the crime scene was entered into DNA databases looking for a match. In April of 2020, Daniel Hahn and District Attorney Anna Marie Schubert announced that they believe they have finally identified the person responsible for ending the life of Mary London. Vernon Parker Parker's life was taken in 1982, one year after Mary's life was taken. The district attorney had this to say. 
investigative genetic genealogy has revolutionized law enforcement's ability to solve violent crime, to identify the guilty and exonerate the innocent. Even though Vernon Parker will not serve time for his crime, the investigators and Mary's surviving family are grateful for answers. Mary's sister Esther said, they really did work hard to find out who did it. Thank you for everybody who was on the case. Twenty-four-year-old Marcel Chandler lived in Mobile, Alabama in 1999. He was employed at an Applebee's restaurant on Airport Boulevard as a waiter. Marcel was known as someone who would go out of his way to say hello while he was an employee at a restaurant. At the time, he was attending a local trade school where he was majoring in computer information systems. He also had a four-year-old son. On the night of December 13, 1999, Marcel's body was found inside his crashed vehicle in the 4000 block of Cresthaven Road. His car had crashed into the yard of a home. It was believed that Marcel was a victim of a car crash but the police noticed gunshot wounds on his body. The autopsy revealed that he passed away due to the gunshots and not the car crash that he was involved in. On June 12, 2020, the police identified 42-year-old Mobile resident Jamal Thomas as a suspect in the case. Thomas has a long rap sheet dating back to 1997. It is unfortunately still unknown what led police to Jamal Thomas. He is currently being held at a Mobile Metro Jail on a $250,000 bond. On the 23rd of June, a 40-year-old man by the name of Damon Wright was also arrested in connection with the cold case. There is also no information about what led police to Damon. Blanca Mabel Otero Alvarez was born in 1952 in the town of Quitilipi, El Chaco province, Argentina. When Blanco was 21 years old, her family moved to her parents' hometown of Silices in Spain. Blanco was a school teacher in Argentina, but it was hard for her to find work in Spain. Eventually, she ended up with a job with the National Rail Board. Blanca left home and went to live in Leon City to be closer to work, but she still visited her parents every week. Then, one day, she disappeared. She did not take anything with her. At first, her family did not report her missing because her father did not want them to. Finally, in 1997, they did report Blanca missing. By then, she would have been 45 years old. Within a few days of reporting her missing, the police found Blanca in the city of Gijon. She told the police, however, that she did not want to get in contact with her family. Her family was disappointed, but determined to reunite with her. They made their way to Gijon, but learned that Blanca realized that they were on their way and gave up her apartment and moved on. In 2005, Blanco wrote a letter to her family that included a photograph of her. In the letter, she asked for forgiveness from her dad and said that she would make contact with her family more. But she never did. Little did her family know that Blanca changed her name to Ava and moved to La Fresneda Estate. She was working, caring for children and pets and cleaning houses. Her neighbors knew her for years without knowing she was a missing person. In August 2020, the local police received several calls from residents in La Fresneda. They were concerned because they hadn't seen their neighbor Ava for a few days. The police had to force the windows open to get into her house. Inside, they found 68-year-old Ava sitting on the floor in her lounge. She was dehydrated and apparently absent mentally, not speaking, confused, and seemingly unaware of what was going on around her. 
She was taken to the Astorias Central University Hospital. They tried to trace her next of kin. It was then discovered that Ava was not on the local census. Finally, she was identified as the missing Blanca Otero Alvarez. Her family was contacted, and they were said to be stunned to hear Blanca had been found and was alive. Blanca's mother is now 90 years old and still needs to be told that her daughter has been found. Stephen Weltick was born on the 13th of June 1952 in St. Louis, Missouri. He lived there his whole life. On April 23, 1993, 40-year-old Stephen was working at Ajax Liquor. He was the owner of the liquor store located on Jeffco Boulevard in Arnold. That morning, a man and a woman went to the store to buy some items. They found Stephen Weltick's body lying face down and called the police. His life was taken by his own gun, execution style. Nothing was taken in the store, so burglary seemed unlikely to be the motive. Investigators questioned Stephen's friends and family members, but no useful information came to light. There were also no witnesses that saw anything suspicious. Despite the investigators' best efforts, there were no leads and the case sadly went cold for many, many years. Then in 2015, a woman came forward claiming that her husband, Laurel Harp, ended the life of Stephen. An associate of Laurel also came forward that year and told police that Laurel Harp was indeed responsible. In September of 2020, the police believed they had enough evidence to prove that Laurel Harp took the life of Stephen Weltick. They went to the Riverview Care Center nursing home in St. Louis to arrest him. Laurel confessed immediately. He claimed, however, that the two of them were fighting when a gunshot went off. That is false, however, since investigators determined that Stephen was on his knees at the time he was shot. Laurel also told investigators that he went to the liquor store with the intention of roughing up Stephen. People would often hire Laurel to collect or enforce. He would often use violence to collect money that people owed. Laurel has served time in prison for unlawful use of a weapon, burglary and stealing. If convicted now, he faces life in prison without a possibility of probation or parole. Sadly, Stephen's mom passed away earlier this year before learning who took her son's life that fateful day 27 years ago. Forty-two-year-old Mark Jeffrey Dribben lived in Portland, Oregon in 1999. He worked for United Airlines. On July 2nd, Mark called his employer and requested the night off because he had a family emergency. The next day he was seen at the Eagle Tavern on Burnside Street. There was nothing unusual about his demeanor. That was the last time anyone saw Mark Dribben. He was a responsible worker. Mark was also very close to his family. His family and friends did not believe that Mark simply left town. Investigators went to his residence. They found that numerous items were missing and that his vehicle had been taken. On the walls of his house, a substantial amount of blood was found. It was clear that someone tried to clean it up. There was no sign of forced entry. A few weeks later, his car was found in an area that he did not frequent. Despite investigators' best efforts, they could not find Mark anywhere. They were, however, pretty sure that he made with foul play because of what they found inside his house. The case went cold. In March 2019, the police's cold case unit reopened Mark's case. They submitted the suspect's DNA from his case to a private lab for forensic genealogy analysis. I'm not exactly sure 
where the DNA came from, perhaps his car or the inside of his house. The private lab compared the DNA in publicly available databases, such as 23andMe and Ancestry.com. After some more testing and investigative work, the police arrested 52-year-old Christopher Lovren in May 2020. He did not live far from where Mark lived. It is not clear how the two men knew each other. It is suspected that Mark's life being taken was due to a relationship going bad between the two men. Even though the case is now solved, there are still some lingering questions. Why did Christopher end the life of Mark? And where did he bury Mark's body? Mark's 87-year-old father had this to say. I'd just like to thank, from the bottom of our hearts, all the hard work from the Portland Police Department and the whole legal system put in to bring this up to the point it is in. Seventy-one-year-old Phyllis Harrison lived in Adelaide, Australia in 1998. She was well known in the community. Phyllis was a member of the Elizabeth Grove Uniting Church and the Bowling Club. Phyllis was last seen on the 2nd of March, 1998, when she was walking her dog at around 7.30 p.m. The next morning, her daughter and grandson entered her Elizabeth South home. They discovered her body in the kitchen. She had been stabbed multiple times. The house was ransacked, but still to this day it is unknown if anything was taken. The police quickly found a knife nearby. It matched the type of knife that was used in the attack. There were no signs of forced entry, suggesting that she had let the person who took her life inside. The police had no idea who could have done this or what the motive could be. The knife was retained by the police so it could be used later when advances in DNA technology were made. Finally, in June of 2020, a 45-year-old man was arrested and charged in connection with the 22-year-old cold case. The South Australia Police Assistant Commissioner Peter Harvey said that the arrest was the result between major crime detectives and forensic experts. He also said that he was prevented from providing details about the man's identity because of legal restrictions. We only know that the man is 45 years old and lived in Northfield. Peter Harvey also was not clear about what led police to this 45-year-old man. In his statement, he did mention that DNA played a part, however, and thanked the forensic experts. Perhaps they were able to collect fingerprints from the knife that was found and matched it to the man this year, but that is just speculation. Phyllis's children are relieved that it won't happen again. Michelle Martinko was born on the 6th of October 1961 in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. She attended Cedar Rapids Kennedy High School. Her plans was to attend Iowa State University to study interior design. She sadly never got the chance to. On the evening of December 19, 1979, Michelle attended an event at a Sheraton Inn in Cedar Rapids. Afterwards, she asked her friend if she wanted to join her on a shopping trip to the Westdale Mall. Her friend declined, so Michelle decided to go on her own. She was last seen between 8 and 9 p.m. outside of a jewelry store. At 2 a.m., Michelle had still not returned home, so her father reported her missing. He began to search for her along with the police. At 4 a.m., the family's car that Michelle had been driving was found in the mall parking lot. Inside was Michelle's body collapsed over a passenger seat. She was stabbed 29 times. There were no witnesses to the crime. The attacker also left no fingerprints behind. The police were not even sure that the attacker was male. Michelle was not indecently assaulted and none of her possessions were taken, so the motive was also not clear. Even though there were no immediate witnesses, there were people who later came forward claiming that they might have seen something that could help the investigation. 
Using hypnosis, her witnesses described a white man in his teens or early 20s, around 6 feet tall and weighing about 170 pounds. On June 19, 1980, the police released a composite sketch based on this information. Michelle's parents passed away in 1995 and 1998 respectively without knowing who took the life of their daughter. In 2006, an investigator received a tip connected to the case. The tip itself led nowhere, but the investigator did notice something interesting while looking through the case files. He found blood had belonged to the attacker. It was then used to create a DNA profile. Thereafter, it was entered into the CODIS database, but no matches were made, unfortunately. Then in 2017, a company that specializes in genetic genealogy was hired to create additional images of the attacker. The images looked vastly different than the ones they used back in 1980. It showed a man with blonde hair and blue eyes. In 2018, the DNA company took the data they had collected and entered it into JetMatch. It is a public genealogy website that has been used by law enforcement to help solve other cases as well. They found one person who shared DNA with the suspect. With more testing, they were able to build a family tree. Finally, it was narrowed down to three brothers who had grown up in Manchester, Iowa. They were placed under surveillance. Investigators began to secretly collect their DNA. On October 29, 2018, an investigator observed that one of the brothers, Jerry Lynn Burns, were drinking multiple sodas using a plastic straw. When Burns disposed of the straw, the investigator collected it and tested it for DNA. The result had came back confirmed that his DNA matched the blood found at a crime scene. Investigators then went to his house to interview him. He denied knowing Michelle and said he was not there when her life was taken. On December 19, 2018, exactly 39 years after Michelle's life was taken, Jerry Lynn Burns was arrested. Early in 2020, the jury found Jerry Lynn Burns guilty. Then on August 7th, he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Alexis Miranda Badger was born on the 23rd of June, 1974, in New Orleans, Louisiana. At five months old, she was placed for adoption by her biological mom. After a period in foster care, she was adopted by the Bowman family who lived in Michigan. She was renamed as Andrea Bowman. In 1988, 14-year-old Andrea told staff at her high school that she was fearful to go home. The school involved the police. Andrea claimed that her adoptive father, Dennis, was touching her inappropriately. Dennis and his wife refused allegations. They claimed that Andrea was just mad because she recently found out that she had been adopted. Shortly after this incident, the Bowman family moved to a very secluded area called Allegan County. Not long after the move, Andrea was reported missing by her adoptive parents. Dennis claimed that Andrea stole from them before running away. Dennis Bowman's criminal record at the time of her disappearance was notable. In 1980, he was arrested after a young woman claimed he attempted to lure and assault her in a wooded area. He pleaded guilty. Ten years after Andrea went missing, in 1998, Dennis was arrested for entering the home of a co-worker in Ottawa County and stealing her underwear. The next year, in 1999, a Jane Doe was discovered in a cornfield in Wisconsin. It was believed that it could be Andrea due to a notable resemblance. Using DNA from Andrea's biological mom, she was ruled out however. For those wondering, the Jane Doe was later identified as Peggy Johnson. 
In November 2019, Dennis Bowman was arrested for taking the life of 25-year-old Kathleen Doyle in 1980. In early 2020, Dennis confessed that he ended the life of his adopted daughter, Andrea. He told them where to find her remains. A few days after confessing, Andrea's remains were found at a 200 block of 136th Avenue of Monterey Township in Allegan County. He faces life in prison for his crimes if convicted. On August 15, 2010, a man's body was found in Buckeye, Arizona. The remains were located in a canal near Miller Road. He was quickly identified to be Luis Victor Mendoza. He had been shot four times. Investigators interviewed a number of witnesses and even identified a potential suspect. But then leads dried up and investigation went cold. Then in July 2020, the Buckeye Police Department's Major Crimes Unit reopened the case. They conducted extensive follow-up interviews with the key witnesses they had identified. All of the witnesses identified Phoenix resident Antonio Padilla as the person who took the life of Luis. Investigators learned that Antonio was released from an Arizona prison earlier in 2020. He served time for a weapons violation and gang activity. In the early hours of July 22, 2020, Phoenix police located Antonio near 19th Avenue and Bell Road. They took him into custody during a traffic stop. At the time of his arrest, he was armed. Buckeye Police Chief Larry Hall said, This is exactly the kind of outcome I expected when forming this team. I have no doubt there will be a resolve to more unsolved cold cases in the near future. Why Antonio took the life of Luis Victor Mendoza is still not known. Sixty-seven-year-old Mary Lindgren lived in an assisted living facility in Covina, California. On January 19, 1996, Mary's body was found in her bedroom at the Covina Villa retirement home. She had been beaten and assaulted before her life was taken. Detectives interviewed facility workers, residents and anyone else connected with the facility. They were unable to come up with a suspect, however. They processed DNA found at the scene and entered it into the state and federal criminal justice databases, but did not find a match. The case went cold. That was until 2019. It was then that investigators decided to take another look into the case. They sent in the DNA they had to the State Department of Justice. Then, in July of 2020, they heard that a match was found. Using the results, they identified 46-year-old Almonte resident David Adolf Bernal. He was arrested in August of 2020. His bail was set at $2 million. Mary's family members said they are relieved that he was finally caught and they credited the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department for not letting the case go. We are profoundly grateful that a person who took her life has been identified and arrested. We are haunted by the brutal crime for nearly two and a half decades. We are relieved to know that justice will finally be served. It was not disclosed if Mary knew David or if she was a victim of a random attack. In 1969, 24-year-old Mary Scott lived in San Diego, California. She used to live in Louisiana with her husband and two daughters. After things did not work out with her husband, however, she moved to California alone. Mary began to work as a cocktail waitress and thereafter a dancer nicknamed Lucky at a local club. On November 20, 1969, 
one of Mary's co-workers went to look for her at her apartment after she did not show up for work. Inside was Mary's body. She had been assaulted and then strangled. The furniture were in disarray and a chain on her door was broken. Investigators tried to follow many leads. Occasionally, they filled in her family about their efforts, but the case eventually went cold. Over the years, DNA technology got a lot more advanced. Mary's sister, Rosalie Sands, noticed this. She asked herself, why can DNA technology not help solve her sister's case? Rosalie then contacted a friend who was a retired police officer in 2019. He then contacted people still on the police force. The case was then reopened. The San Diego Police Cold Case Unit took the DNA that was retrieved from the crime scene back in 1969 and used forensic genealogy to identify a suspect. The results of the DNA test led them to 75-year-old John Jeffrey Sipos. John was in the Navy in San Diego when the crime took place in 1969. On October 24, 2020, John was arrested in Schnecksville, Pennsylvania. He is currently being held at a Lehigh County Detention Center. Rosalie said this after learning who took her sister's life. He went on to live his life, and that is the thing that makes me the most upset. When I learned that he's free and happy, it's upsetting to me that he had that normal life all these years. She had so much life ahead of her that just got stolen. This case took 50 years to be solved, making it one of the oldest cold cases to be solved using DNA.